the democratic processes are corrupted. The people are ignorant. They've got no idea of what's going on or what to do about it. And neither do the economists. And certainly the policymakers in government have a clue. And so correcting it is really out of the question. It's going to blow up. This video is brought to you by Reluctant Preppers. Click here to subscribe for free to ReluctantPreppers.com. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with FinanceAndLiberty.com and with us today is Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy during the Reagan administration. Dr. Roberts, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleased to be with you, Elijah. All right, so I was wondering, can you tell us a little bit about your experience as the United States Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Economic Policy? And being a critic of the current system of how our current monetary system is run, um, were you a critic back then? And did you face any challenges having to work within the system? Well, Elijah, the challenges were different. Uh, we thought they were very large, but not compared to the present day challenges. The challenge, um, I had, I was in charge of domestic U.S. economic policy, was to deal with a stagflation. And now that was before your time. And the problem was that the economy was confronted with an inability to grow economically unless the rate of inflation rose so that we were having to pay for economic growth with rising rates of inflation and uh, or the other side of that was if we wanted to combat the inflation, we had to pay for bringing inflation under control with rising rates of unemployment. And this was called Phillips curve trade-offs, and it ended up in stagflation. And there was no solution for this in the conventional uh, economic theory and policy of the time. And that's where supply-side economics came from. The existing theory was incomplete. It wasn't able to recognize a problem or a solution. And the supply side economists came in and provided that. And without going into all of it, were able to uh, cure the stagflation. And the economy then was able to grow for the next 20 years, the 80s and 90s, without having to pay for the growth with rising rates of inflation. And yes, there were a great many uh, problems in correcting this because uh, Republicans um, only understood economics in terms of budget deficits. Oh my God, if there's a deficit, the place is going to hell, we can't. So they were prepared to do anything to avoid a deficit, which meant that there wasn't going to be any policy that could cure the stagflation. Uh, Wall Street thought that they weren't, they weren't able to understand supply side economics and they were thinking of it in the traditional Keynesian terms. And they said, well, if you cut the marginal tax rates when inflation's high, consumers will spend more money and inflation will go even higher and it'll ruin our stock and bond portfolios and we'll all go bust. Well, of course, nothing like that happened. But overcoming the Republican reluctance and overcoming Wall Street's opposition, that, that was a hard job. It was a lot of work. Now, once that was done, the world began to change because up until that time, the struggles of the U.S. economy, uh, sort of, though no, nowhere near as serious as the Soviet struggles, were least seen as struggles. Things weren't all well here either, and so the, the Soviets weren't that disturbed about their problems because we were having problems. But when the um, stagflation problem was cured, the Soviets realized that they were at a clear disadvantage in the Cold War competition, and Reagan was able to bring them to negotiate the end of the Cold War. And this was, of course, uh, uh, 
had all kinds of unimagined consequences, one of which was the Indians, the socialists in India and the communists in China, reassessed their own policies and decided that uh, planning and socialism didn't really work because, look, it had failed in the Soviet Union, but that the Americans had rejuvenated capitalism and it was working fine. So they would get on the winning side and they opened up their vast underutilized labor forces to Western capital. And then, so with the Soviet collapse in 1991, it began the demise of first world industrial manufacturing countries because the corporations started moving the production of goods and services that they sold in their home markets offshore in order to take advantage of the much lower prices of labor. And when they were able to drop the labor costs so much, the profits went up and Wall Street was happy, shareholders were happy, and the performance bonuses of the CEOs went sky high. And we began having what is now a very serious inequality in the distribution of income and also the loss of tax base, jobs, careers, all of that's been moved offshore. What used to be uh, manufacturing jobs for Americans and what used to be professional service jobs such as uh, information technology, software engineering, research, design, these have moved offshore. So there's been no growth in American consumer income uh, for a decade or longer, depends on how you measure it. And um, the U.S. economy uh, was unable to grow, lacking any growth in consumer income. And so Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve started substituting the growth in consumer debt for the missing growth in consumer income. And we know where that got us, the real estate bubble, the real estate crisis, the derivative bubbles, and, and the ongoing crisis, the ongoing financial crisis. And the inability of traditional stimulative policies, such as huge budget deficits, fantastic money creation, uh, to move the economy into a growth mode. So the problems today are much more serious because at least uh, in 1980, there were some economists, supply siders, who understood the situation and had a solution. Today, the economic profession hasn't a clue. So I would say the situation today is far worse than what I had to deal with um, 30 years ago. And exactly, um, I know you've said that although officially the crisis of 08 ended in 2009, I mean, we're still in an economic crisis and a recession. So, I mean, do you see any way out of this or is the economy going to get worse or can, can we somehow turn this around and the economy could grow again? I don't think it can be turned around. I mean, conceptually, theoretically, uh, you could, but realistically, I don't think it can be done, first of all, because the real situation is not understood. And number two, turning it around would be against the interest of very powerful forces, such as the offshoring transnational corporations. They benefit, at least in the short term. And of course, CEOs are only there in the short term. These are not people who stay at the head of the company for 20 or 30 years. It's not an old Henry Ford <laughs> situation. The CEO goes in when he's 60, 61 years old, and he's out when he's 65. So the time horizon is short term, and they make profits by policies that lead to the demise of the economy. When you move the jobs offshore, as I've already said, you move the the tax base offshore, the consumer income offshore, you kill the consumer market, and so on and so on. So, But that benefits the people making the decisions. So I think between the incentives that they face, which is their short-term income, and the general ignorance, especially of the economics profession, um, the situation can't be turned around. You see, uh, most of them think the real problem is the financial crisis. And of course, that is a problem. But the real serious problem is the offshoring problem. The economy is simply so much of it 
It was just moved offshore. Now, how are you going to get it back? Basically, you can't. You you can't get it back. So there are some theoretical solutions, but they're not. I don't think you'd be able to put them into effect. So let's say um, today you were reappointed the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. What would you do to help the economy? Well, I wouldn't be able to do anything. As I said, uh, the recognition of the problem isn't there. I, I know what it is, but I would have to convince people. And, of course, the supply siders had many years of work making it clear to people. You know, we were writing. We had the Wall Street Journal editorial page with Jude Wininsky. Art Laffer was going around the country making speeches. I was writing. And I was making speeches. I was in the congressional staff. I was able to make a large number of Democratic senators and even some Republican senators aware of the problem. We had Jack Kemp in the House and Marjorie Holt, people who understood the problem. And, but today there's nothing like that. So I would be there all alone trying to explain things to people, and it would be one voice, and they'd be hearing 10,000 other voices. Now, if I was, had absolute power and was a dictator, then I think what could be done assuming, you know, you could make it stick, would be to change the way corporations are taxed, tax them on the basis of the geographical location in which they add value to their product. So if they produce at home for their home markets, they would have a low tax rate. But if they produce offshore for the home market, they would have a high tax rate. And so you could use the difference in the tax rate to offset the labor cost advantage of producing offshore. That would bring them home. But by now, since the Chinese have our technology in the factories, we would have to then shield them with tariffs, like we did in the old days. Shield our own producers, because they've taken the technology and the business know-how and given it to the Chinese. So the Chinese will have everything that our guys would have, plus cheaper labor. So after bringing the corporation's home, we would have to put up a tariff wall. And of course, all the free market economists would go berserk and there would be uh, assassination plans to get rid of Paul Craig Roberts. The other problem would be the wars. We can't afford these wars. They don't do anything for anybody except the profits of a handful of military security complexes. The wars are amazingly expensive. You know, Joseph Stieglitz and Linda Bilms have concluded that the Iraq war cost a minimum of $3 trillion and that the Afghan war also cost a minimum of $3 trillion. So there's $6 trillion. That's um, almost half of the growth of the deficit since the 21st century began. You would have to stop the wars. And if you stop the wars... Uh, you, you'd have to close so many of these military bases we have everywhere trying to establish hegemony over the world. And this then would reduce the federal budget deficit, and the Federal Reserve would not have to be creating so many billions of new dollars every year, a thousand billion dollars a year, uh, to help finance the budget deficit. And so the economic situation will look look stabilized to foreigners, they'd be more willing to hold the dollar, the outlook for the dollar's reserve currency would go up. So those are two things that theoretically could be done, but practically I don't think can be done because the interest groups that benefit from what's destroying the economy are too powerful. They're too powerful for a president, certainly too powerful for an assistant treasury secretary. Speaking of the Federal Reserve and just them printing so much money, I mean, you say theoretically it could be done, but practically, I mean, Bernanke has no choice. People say, you know, Bernanke is going crazy printing $85 billion a month, but you're saying he has no choice. Am I right about that? Well, he probably has no choice right now. They didn't have to go down that path, but they've been on it now for, what, three or four years? So once you get on a path like that, you've pump so much liquidity into the bond market and into the stock market that there are massive bubbles. You know, the, the bond prices are so high that the real interest rate is negative. 
that m makes no sense to have bonds with negative interest rate when you're hemorrhaging a uh, trillion dollars of new debt every year. And the same with the stock market. The money they have pumped into the banks hasn't gone out to consumers and loans. It's gone into the stock market. So whereas they did not need to go down that path, once you get on it, it's almost impossible to get off of it because it's, it'll blow up the bond and stock markets. Now, if the two policies I told you about, uh, you change the way you tax corporations, you bring them back, which creates a tax base here again, revenues, that reduces the deficit, puts people to work with good jobs again and you stop the wars that, that cost you a fantastic amount of money, then the deficit uh, situation looks totally different. It declines as a massive problem, and therefore Bernanke wouldn't need uh, to be buying the treasury bonds. He might still have to buy the um, mortgage-backed securities in order to support the balance sheets of the banks too big to fail. The real reason for the Bernanke policy is to support the balance sheet of the banks, the interest rate related derivatives or the debt related derivatives on the bank's books are kept high by the purchase of the bonds. So that makes them look solvent when in fact they are. And <clears throat> How he would get out of that, I think they would simply have to let the banks fail and reorganize them. So you could get out of this, but the democratic processes are corrupted. The people are ignorant. They've got no idea of what's going on or why, how, what to do about it. And neither do the economists or 99% of them. And certainly the policymakers in government haven't a clue. And so correcting it is really out of the question. It's going to blow up. It'll go on until they can't, and then it's going to blow up. And when is that going to be? I don't know. It's gone on longer than I thought possible. I know you recommend a stricter bank regulation and a profound reform of the Federal Reserve System, but it doesn't seem like you see this happening, do you? No, not until there's a major collapse they can't <clears throat> fix by printing more money. You see, the... This is this was another unintended consequence of the success of supply side economics, because when supply side economics uh, succeeded, it made uh, everyone involved in policy think that my goodness, if a heavily regulated market economy can work this well, imagine how much better it would work if it wasn't regulated. So let's get rid of all the regulation. So we've had 25 years in the United States, in England, in France, of deregulation and privatization. And here, of course, the deregulation was mainly financial. They just simply turned the financial sector loose of any oversight or control. Nothing was regulated. They repealed Glass-Steagall. They let commercial investment banking merge so that Investment bankers could use depositors' accounts um, to leverage their casino gambling bets. Uh, they refused to uh, regulate over-the-counter derivatives. Uh, they removed the position limits on speculation. They let uh, debt leverage go to unbelievable uh, lengths. And so they get a crisis. I mean, everybody knew this would happen, except they said, oh, well, markets are self-regulating. So this was a, an ideological extension of Reaganomics, of the success of Reaganomics. If it hadn't had such success, it never would have occurred to them that we can make it more successful by taking away the regulation. Because, my word, if it can do this good a job when it's half controlled by the government, just imagine if it was free. So that whole libertarian belief was wrong. It was just, it was an ideology. It didn't have any basis in experience and was directly contradicted by the experience of the 20s and 30s. That's where the regulation came from, the fact that the previous financial system uh, had not been regulated and had blown up. So they put in place these regulations that kept it stable. 
And so the minute they took them off, it went unstable again. I wanted to turn our focus to an article you wrote recently. You wrote, quote, If the dollar were not the reserve currency, Washington would not be able to finance its wars or continue to run large trade and budget deficits. Therefore, protecting the exchange value of the dollar is Washington's prime concern if it is to remain a superpower. Can you explain to our viewers in what ways the government is trying to preserve the value of the dollar? Well, you can see it in the uh, interventions in the precious metals market, and you can see it in the success of Washington's pressure on uh, Japan to inflate its own currency, on the European Central Bank to print euros, and you can see it in the fact that all kinds of other countries are having to inflate their own currency in order to prevent a massive rise in the exchange value of their currency, which then would curtail their exports. For example, uh, Switzerland uh, had, had to announce that they were not going to allow uh, flight from the dollar and the euro to drive the Swiss franc any higher, that any future dollars and euros that came into Switzerland to be converted into francs would be, would be accommodated by printing new francs. So we've got the whole world printing money, so that makes the dollar look, you know, the Fed's printing it too. And if only the Fed was printing it, then the whole world would say, my gosh, we've got to get away from dollars. But we've got other large currencies being printed. The Japanese is printed. The, the euro is printed. And then all these little countries are forced into it. So where can you go? How can you escape the dollar? There's nowhere to go. <laughs> and the Chinese haven't yet let their currency be that uh, – tradable. They still have some restraints and, and constraints on, on the ability to acquire their currency. So there was gold and silver. And so what we've seen uh, over the last decade, uh, the price of gold went from something like $270 to 1900 And so the policymakers in Washington uh, noticed uh, in 2011, look, uh, if the dollar is losing value this rapidly in relation to gold, it's going to occur to people that it's also losing value in relation to other currencies, and the exchange rate will collapse. And when the exchange rate collapses, we lose control over interest rates, and we won't be able to make the banks look solvent or finance the budget deficit, and the whole system will blow up. So we've got to suppress the price of gold and silver. And so with the way they do that, there are two markets for gold and silver. There's the market where people actually take possession of it and take it into their personal possession. And there's the futures market, the paper market, COMEX in New York, where speculators bet on future prices. And <clears throat> there is where the price of gold is set. It's set in the speculative paper market, not in the actual physical market. So the Fed can go in or have the bullion banks go in, the great big banks that it's bailing out, go in and dump massive numbers of shorts on that market, on the in, in COMEX. And all those shorts being dumped at once will drive down the price, will trigger all kinds of stop loss orders, will result in margin calls and massive selling. And that then drives down the price. So that's been going on in a strong way since the beginning of April and seems to still be going on, though not with the kind of massive assault of, you know, maybe 100, 200, 300 tons of gold dumped all at once. Not real gold, but shorts, paper measures of gold. And COMEX, most of the Futures contracts are settled in cash. Hardly anybody ever takes delivery of the gold. It's a place for betting and speculating. And so that, that peculiar feature that you have a bifurcated gold market where the actual physical market doesn't set the price, that lets the Federal Reserve drive down the price of gold and silver. And so the result then is to protect the dollar. You see, you have to protect the dollar when you're printing a thousand billion new ones every year. And they've been doing this for several years. 
and there's no real uh, sign that they can stop because, as we've already said, if they stop, that means bond prices are going to fall, which means interest rates are going to go up, and the stock market will collapse along with the bond market and the banks. And so when, you, when you're printing $1,000 billion dollars, and there's not a demand for $1,000 billion new dollars every year. We see increasingly countries moving away from the use of the dollar to settle their own balance of payments. You know, they're just not using it as reserve currency anymore. You have the BRICS, their agreements. You have China's agreement with Russia, China's agreement with Japan, China's agreement with Australia. They're settling their trade balance in their own currencies. They're not first converting their currencies into dollars and settling in dollars and then, and then going back into the other currencies. See, that keeps the demand for dollars high. But when they cease to use it, demand for dollars goes away. So that's the problem that the Fed has. It's creating more dollars than there's a demand for. And so to protect the dollar, they have to rig all the markets. All of the financial markets are rigged. It's not just the interest rate or LIBOR. They're all rigged. And how can you rig all markets forever? You can't. So it looks to me like when it's going to be a much bigger blow up than we've ever had before. So from what you've said today, it seems like you're thinking that we're headed on the road to basically economic collapse. And there's no real way that we can turn this thing around so what are some things that people can do now to prepare for what's coming? Because it doesn't seem like there's a really easy way out of this. Uh, no, there's not. You know, you don't know what disruptions there might be. You don't know whether there'll be disruptions in energy, in food supplies. You don't know whether uh, the dollar will be hyperinflated. Uh, and so it would pay everybody to have some kind of uh, uh, stocks to let them adjust to a new situation in the event that things do go badly wrong and be like an insurance policy. People should have stock food. They should have um, a, a, a way to make payment, you know, whether it's things that can be bartered or whether it's gold or silver coins. They should have something just because if there's a big, massive change and all of a sudden uh, you can't get to the store or you or the store is can't get food delivered or there's not anything there or if people say well I don't know what that hundred dollar bill is worth it's all inflation is high and I don't want it and those are about all you can do you can just try to have a buffer that gives you some time to adjust of course no only the very very rich could have buffers large enough to last them for a lifetime but ordinary people should have some kind of buffer just to give them time to survive while the shock uh, that could hit the system uh, is uh, absorbed and, and new arrangements arise. That's about all I know of that they, that they could do. All right. And um, before we let you go, then, um, people can find you at paulcraigroberts.org. And I know you're um, the author of numerous books. Can people find those on your website as well? I think most of them are listed there. And the, the ones that are in print, you can get from Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble or uh, Clarity Press. And I think most of them can be found in, in uh, the used book shops that market on, on Amazon. So, yes, the books are available if um, – they want to get a clear view of the present economic situation. That's the book that's just come out, uh, The Failure of Laissez-Faire Capitalism and Economic Dissolution of the West. That's out as an e-book and it's now out in print from Clarity Press. All right, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, thank you so much for joining us today and I hope we can have you on again soon. Pleased to talk to you, Elijah, and all the best. This video was brought to you by ReluctantPreppers.com. Click here to watch Reluctant Preppers' latest interview with Turd Ferguson. The system is broken, but you can still thrive. Click here to subscribe for free to FinanceAndLiberty.com and also our sponsor, ReluctantPreppers.com, helping you be aware and prepared.